Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, for those of you here in person as well as those of you online, uh, it is wonderful to have everyone together to, for our session on getting personal with advanced biliary tract cancers, insights on personalizing upfront and sequential therapy, sequential care with immunotherapy and targeted agents. My name is Dr. Rachna Shroff. I am a GI medical oncologist at the University of Arizona Cancer Center, and I'm actually going to let each of my speakers introduce themselves. Um, I'm Dr. Ruth He. I'm a GI medical oncologist in Washington, D.C. at the Georgetown University Hospital. And I'm Aaron Scott. I'm a GI medical oncologist at the University of Arizona. So I'd like to thank Peerview and the Clangio Carcinoma Foundation for providing this session, and AstraZeneca and Insight, uh, who provided educational grants to support this. If you haven't already, please do complete the pre-event survey, and, and a, just a reminder to look out, because throughout the session, we will have additional follow-up questions that kind of poll you throughout the course of the presentation. Uh, and then please do remember to submit your questions. Uh, we're doing all of that via the iPads and online, so we will do our best to make sure we hit everything during the Q&A session. In terms of uh, being able to access all of this, please be sure to visit us at peerview.com slash biliary-sf23. That's where you can get the slides and practice aids and download them after the event. Also, if you please do join us on Twitter and social media so that you can be part of our conversation in the social media world. So our agenda today, we're gonna start with kind of framing everything with the current status of care when it comes to biliary tract cancers and where we have opportunities, what can we do better? Uh, and then the clinical consults will be broken down into a couple different sections. The first will really be focused on exploring next generation care in biliary tract cancers and upfront treatment decisions made clear, as well as next steps in advanced biliary tract cancer in terms of sequential management with targeted therapies. And then we will, of course, make sure we have time for the audience Q&A. So let's talk about biliary cancers. Biliary cancers are often lumped together. Uh, for those of us who treat this disease, we know that they're not all one disease. Uh, they are often broken down into intrahepatic, uh, perihilar, distal, or extrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, as well as gallbladder cancer. And you can see a lot of that distinction is really based anatomically on where exactly the tumor or, uh, originates in terms of intrahepatic, the intrahepatic biliary system versus uh, the bile ducts that are uh, in the hilum of the liver versus the common bile duct or the, dis uh, the distal cholangios. And as you can see, the NCCN practice guidelines have a lot of information on them now when we talk about unresectable and metastatic cholangiocarcinoma. And what is interesting is, is when you look at this a few years back, there, this was a much more limited list. So we've really made some dramatic progress when it comes to treating these diseases. When we talk about primary disease, we really think about the unresectable but non-metastatic versus the metastatic. And so those are broken down on this slide between the blue and the green. And you'll note that in the unresectable non-metastatic, there are options to be considered outside of systemic therapy. To be clear, uh, clinical trials are always an option, so please do keep that in mind. But there are absolutely options in the liver-directed therapy spaces that can be considered in unresectable non-metastatic disease versus those patients who are metastatic in which systemic therapy really does play the backbone of treatment. Uh, oftentimes we can integrate other options like liver-directed treatment options, but systemic therapy really has a, has a stronghold there. And when we talk about systemic therapy, we look at things in the frontline setting, meaning in newly diagnosed untreated patients, and then subsequent lines of therapy. And you can see that there is actually a number of different options now for our patients. Uh, most of them you will see are gemcitabine-based co uh, combination therapies, gemcitabine and platinum being category one, as well as with the newest FDA approval, gemcitabine, cisplatin, and drivalumab. There are tumor agnostic approvals that are relevant to some of our patients, but then in the subsequent line, uh, lines of therapy, it gets a little bit more complicated, and it's uh, an interesting space in a rap rapidly changing landscape. I think the reason it's rapidly changing and has become incredibly interesting is, as I say, that cholangiocarcinoma and biliary tract cancers are the poster child for precision oncology. Uh, we really are winning this game, in my opinion. Uh, and when we, what we have done over time by sequential and really precise and more defined met methods of biomarker testing or molecular profiling, we recognize that not only are these diseases very distinct anatomically, they're also distinct molecularly. And so the genomic markers that we see in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma are very different from extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which are very different than gallbladder cancer. 
And this graphic has a lot of information on it and it kind of lists some of the more common targets that are identified. But it's important to recognize that while some of them are in the 10 to 15% or 20% of patient range, some of them are very, very rare, but still very important to identify and recognize because we have approved therapies or therapies in clinical trial form that could be considered. That doesn't even begin to touch the tip of the iceberg when it comes to really better understanding the subsets of patients uh, that we're thinking through for immunotherapy. Obviously, we have Duvalumab in the frontline setting, but as we're getting better at immune profiling, we're trying to better understand what the biomarkers look like in that space so that we can optimize therapy for those patients. While we've made a lot of progress, I will be the first to admit that we still have a lot of, uh, of need. There's a lot of shortcomings when it comes to the management of biliary cancers. This is data that was presented uh, at ASCO GI, I think in 2021, that looked at a little over a thousand oncology providers and asked them um, how they felt about using targeted therapy in advanced cholangiocarcinoma. And 81% of them actually responded that they did not feel very confident in how to leverage and integrate targeted therapies into the treatment armamentarium for these patients. Uh, moreover, out of this uh, work, we learned that 85% of patients initiated gemcitabine-based chemotherapy as their first-line treatment, which is not surprising since it really has been the standard of care since 2010. But when you start looking in subsequent lines of therapy, about 46% of patients initiated second-line treatment. So really about half move on to second-line treatment based on this data. And in that space, the majority of those patients were receiving 5-FU-based chemotherapies. And then there's an even steeper cliff. So we drop down to about 17% of patients who make it to third line treatment. And I think the, the kind of really important thing to recognize is that in this space, the bar is really low. And we see that in the ABC06 data, but we even see it here in this type of a, a real world kind of look where the median time to treatment on the first line was 3.2 months and both the second and third lines were 2.7 months. So we really need to do better in terms of finding optimal therapies that our patients can tolerate and stay on and hopefully kind of see actual clinical benefit. What are the other shortcomings? We know that unfortunately when you look at consummate data, only three to 5% of adult patients with cancer enroll in clinical trials. That's not just cholangio, that's all cancers, but it's important to kind of put that in perspective because those of us that sit at academic medical centers and in ivory towers, we often forget kind of the real world truth of this and that we really need to do better about creating and designing and running clinical trials, opening more clinical trials and informing our patients about clinical trials. Additionally, clinical trial enrollment specifically in biliary tract cancers is really complex. It's, it's challenged by a number of different things. Uh, molecular heterogeneity and, and the fact that now we have all of these different biomarkers and all these different subsets, uh, as well as underlying liver dysfunction. A lot of our biliary tract cancer patients are, uh, have underlying cirrhosis or other liver complications that can make it difficult to put a patient on a trial, especially patients that have hyler or uh, extrahepatic tumors and we are dealing with biliary obstruction and the morbidity associated with that. Not to mention the obvious of the relative rarity of biliary tract cancers and cholangial carcinoma. While we are seeing a rise in incidence, it is still, quote unquote, a rare tumor, at least in the eyes of a lot of, of, a lot of companies, the NCI, et cetera. Obviously, that has a huge and profound impact in terms of developing and having therapeutic options, as well as in terms of creating disparities in terms of outcomes. Um, and I think all of that kind of plays into why we, while we've moved the needle a little bit, we still have a lot of work to do. Additionally, little is very, very little is really understood right now about the immune microenvironment. We are just, we are new, we are brand new in the biliary tract cancer space to the immunotherapy game, and we're just starting to understand the differences between intrahepatic cholangios, extrahepatic cholangios, and gallbladder cancer. And there's a lot of really interesting work happening to really immune profile uh, each of these different diseases, look at differences within the Western world and the Eastern world, et cetera, but we're, we're lagging behind, we're not there yet. And then of course, with the rarity of molecular subtypes like I alluded to, it's sometimes hard for us to really accrue to these larger confirmatory studies. So you all know that we have a number of accelerated approvals that have come through. It's been an incredible two years, almost three years, in the cholangiocarcinoma space. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these are single arm accelerated approvals that 
require large confirmatory studies, often with randomization. And now you're talking about a needle within a, within a haystack in terms of finding these patients, having them be eligible for clinical trial, and large numbers to power a study appropriately. I cannot overemphasize this slide enough, and it's not just because Stacy and Melinda are in the audience. The Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation is truly an excellent resource for professionals, patients, caregivers. I can tell you this. I can attest to this. They have been part of my life for 10 plus years. They are absolutely committed to the mission of finding and curing and improving the quality of life for those affected by cholangiocarcinoma and bile duct cancer. Uh, so on the slides, please do access them because there's hyperlinks to their website where you can get all kinds of information about the disease, connect with other patients, understand what clinical trials are out there, as well as resources. They have this incredible specialist map and you can look exactly where you live to see where the specialist is or who the specialist is. So please do uh, reach out to them. They're just an incredible community. And I'd like to thank them, of course, for partnering with us on this. And with that, I am happy to hand it over uh, to discuss the next gen care now in personalized upfront treatment decisions. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. I think Rashna has um, laid out the ground, and now we're going to dive into the data. Um, so first, let's start with a real case. Um, so this patient, Mark, presented uh, to my clinic with a history of uh, abdominal pain, fatigue, and unintentional weight loss. So the initial workup showed the, uh, his CA99 was not elevated. The patient actually has a good liver kidney function. If you look at the CBC, the platelet count is not uh, decreased. Um, CT scan, which showed on the right side panel, um, showed, a, uh, showed a large tumor and with multiple tumor in the right lobe of the liver. And uh, the largest measure is seven times uh, by 6.4 centimeter. Ultrasound guided liver biopsy, and it's hard to miss a very big tumor here, and showed poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. I see staining of the tumor uh, favor intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Patient has an ECOG of one, performance of one, and at the time, and there's um, patient's tumor was sent for profile. So now this patient is evaluated for frontline therapy. So as you all know, um, we have a new um, uh, first line option, FDA approved last year, um, uh, the Valumab plus GEMSYS supported by the Topaz-1 study. And so let's talk about how this started. So uh, the, the Viomab in combination with GEMSYS was first evaluated in a phase two study, 121 patients, and 45 uh, out of the 121 patients received the combination of the Viomab and plus gemcitabine cisplatinine. That phase two data reported a PFS of 11 months and um, over uh, survival, median survival of 20 months, which compared very favorably to the standard of care, which was uh, GEMSYS. Because of the promising data, a com confirmatory uh, randomized phase three study, global phase three study, Topaz-1 study um, uh, were, uh, was completed, was put together and completed. And this is the Topaz-1 study. So patients um, are randomized. So Key eligibility criteria. Patient can have locally advanced cholangiocarcinoma unresectable or metastatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma and pre previously untreated or had recurrence, um, uh, had uh, like more than six months from surgery and uh, patient uh, had a good performance status. A randomized to the Viomap 1500 milligrams uh, fixed dose every three weeks plus GEMSYS day one, day eight out of 21 day cycle uh, versus placebo plus GEMSYS. Patients receive the combination treatment for up to six months. Then the chemotherapy gets uh, a stop, was stopped and the Viomab or placebo uh, will be, con uh, will, the treatment continues as a maintenance treatment. Um, so the study stratified for Disease status is patients have local have um, initial diagnosis with recurrence or, um, or anatomic location of the tumor. The primary study endpoint was OS, uh, 
key secondary endpoints, including uh, PFS um, over re uh, response rate, duration of response, and safety. Sorry. Okay. This is the updated data presented uh, at last year's uh, at the ESMO meeting. And so there was additional follow-up compared uh, to the data that was initially uh, presented. So um, the combination of the value map plus gem sys provide a improved over survival benefit uh, with hazard ratio of 0 0.76. The divergent uh, uh, Kaplan-Meier curve and also the survival rate at 18 months and 24 months uh, highlight the uh, potential benefit, long-term benefit of the value map plus gem sys. So at two years, about 24% of patients uh, were alive with the combination of treated with the Viumab plus Gemsys compared to e about 11% of patients were alive at two years received Gemsys treatment. So um, the survival benefit was observed uh, co uh, uh, consistently across all uh, subgroup analysis. And if you look at the different PDL1 cutoff, again, you, the, the, uh, you, you see the overall survival benefit with the addition of the value map to GEMSYS. So this uh, tells us patient ben may benefit from the combination of the value map plus GEMSYS uh, with the PDL1 high or low uh, cholangiocarcinoma tumor. PDL1 uh, expression in this disease seems not a very good biomarker. So here is PFS. So uh, the study also met the PFS endpoint with a hazard ratio of 0 0.75. And you can see uh, at nine months, um, the progression-free survival rate, and 12 months, the two curves separate very nicely. And additional secondary endpoint, the overall response rate um, and, and duration of response at um, nine months and 12 months or better compared to, uh, you know, with the, the value map plus GEMSYS compared to placebo plus GEMSYS. And there were not, uh, there were, um, so, um, so if you look at the safety, uh, just looking at the number, uh, addition of the value map to GEMSYS seems not to increase um, the amount, uh, the percentage of toxicities. Uh, compared to what was observed in patients received GEMSYS. Now, this is a busy slide. If you look at any grade three, four uh, treatment-related AEs, was 62% from the Devayamab plus GEMSYS, 64.9% placebo plus GEMSYS. If you look at the, the any treatment-related AE leads to discontinuation, 8.9% in Devayamab plus GEMSYS, and 11.4% in patients received just GEMSYS plus placebo. So it's um, quite well tolerated when, when, uh, with uh, uh, addition of the value map to GEMSYS treatment. So now uh, this is hard off press, um, the, 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 the data. The initial report from IBRI 151 was uh, presented as, as oral abstract by Dr. Anthony Alcori this afternoon. And uh, so I want to just talk about it, um, talk about the study. So this study, this is the study design. And so patients are randomized. This is a randomized phase two study. Patients are randomized to um, BEV plus atezolizumab and GEMSYS. And the other arm is atezolizumab plus GEMSYS. So you can see both are experimental arm. There's no uh, historic, uh, there's no GEMSYS arm in this study. And the primary endpoint um, is PFS. And the rationale for the study, and so, you know, uh, there are a lot of preclinical st study and, um, and even clinical data support of combining anti-VEGF therapy with immunotherapy. Um, angiogenesis inhibition by um, uh, blocking VEGF or VEGFR, uh, we believe uh, reverse um, the immune suppression 
of EGF um, in a tumor immune environment. And the data, uh, there's uh, good data, clinical data, has support the combination of bevacizumab and tizuluzumab in lung small cell lung cancer in HCC. So which provide a good strong rationale to test this in biliary tract cancer. So um, I'm going to just talk about the data. The, the, there is no significant difference in PFS between the two arms. And the response rate is also not too different. And if we look at the difference is the, dura uh, the, um, the uh, duration of response at six months was higher in the four drug combination compared to the, uh, uh, the three drug combination. So this is a relatively small phase two study. Just based on this data, we've not seen a very strong signal that support the four drug combination. Of course, this is an important combination, maybe need further um, study. So now let's come back to this patient. So this patient was treated with the combination of the Valumab, gemcitabine, cisplatin, and you can see he had a good response. Uh, the baseline scan uh, and then lower panel is 11 months later. So the response actually is quite durable in this specific patient. Most patients, um, you, you all treat uh, patients with cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, about six months into chemo combination, patients start to develop a lot of myelosuppression. So this patient also developed myelosuppression. Eventually, we have to stop the cisplatin gemcitabine chemotherapy and continue the Viomap treatment in these patients. And so now with precision, with like uh, the evolving landscape in precision oncology in cholangiocarcinoma, so all patients should have their tumor uh, profiled. And this patient also has his tumor profiled. Now we have two questions and for you to uh, answer on the iPad, which I don't think I, Okay, so um, I, I'm not asked to, to do anything with those questions. I think they're just collecting information. Now let's talk about other immunotherapy options for biliary tract cancer. I think Topaz-1 is the first study has shown in the randomized phase three setting the benefit of immunotherapy. So there are a lot of interest of, of combination or other immunotherapy com uh, combinations um, in biliary tract cancer. So, there is some data on LEAP-005. So Levetinib, which is a anti-VGF, PDGF, FGF, or KIT and RET inhibitor, and by itself, it has a single agent response rate of about 11% in biliary tract cancer. And LEAP-005 is to evaluate Levetinib plus pembrolizumab in many type of cancer. So there were 31 patients enrolled and there was a res response rate of 10%, disease control rate of 68%. And this led to the expansion of this uh, uh, to a, a, a cholangial carcinoma cohort to be of 100 patients. Another one that's interesting is arginase inhibitor. It has a different mechanism of action. So it restored the arginine level that alleviate myeloid-derived immunosuppression in the tumor microenvironment. And this is a phase one, two study was presented last year, and uh, in combination with GEMSYS, reported a response rate of 24% uh, and disease control rate um, of 66%, uh, which is quite interesting, and it's, uh, it will be uh, further evaluated. Um, so there are a lot of any other ongoing trials. Uh, this is just a short list. And I think the one on the top is it's, um, the Keynote 966, evaluate the combination of pembrolizumab plus GEMSYS. This study has finished enrollment and we're anxiously waiting for the results. And this will be an, another randomized phase three trial evaluating a anti-PD-1 therapy in combination with GEMSYS in the frontline setting. And there are list of, a list of phase two or phase one, two study. And there's now, uh, I think, people are designing by specific antibody and um, combinations. So on and on, there are a lot of, uh, you're gonna see a lot of new, interesting new data coming out. So um, I'm gonna sh this show this NCCN guideline slide the second time. So you can see there's a list of um, uh, 
uh, a lot of systemic therapy options. In the frontline setting, the, uh, the, the current standard is the Viomat plus GEMSYS. In patients who are not candidate for that, there are many different chemotherapy, alternative chemotherapy options available to patients. In the subsequent line therapy, Forfox was supported by ABC06, uh, which is a randomized phase um, phase, uh, three uh, phase two study that support the benefit of four fox in the second line setting. And uh, Fulfiria has been recommended in category two, uh, 2B. And there are some data uh, on liposomal renal TCAM plus 5 if you look Warren. And there were two studies. And the very initial study, which showed very promising results, was uh, the NIFTI study from, uh, from Asia that showed very promising results. And the similar study, uh, the data was pr presented at last fall at ESMO 2022, actually did not really show the similar results um, of this combination. So there's still some doubt about how, um, how, this will, how, how much this will contribute to the treatment. But you can see um, cholangiocarcinoma is really a very heterogeneous disease. And so sometimes the, the, the trial data uh, in different parts of the world may, 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 may not uh, be the same. So now I'm going to change gear a little bit, and this is new data uh, in uh, came out in 2022. This is agnostic approval of uh, NTRAC inhibitors, and there's, there's um, I, I am talking about this is because there is a small portion of cholangiocarcinoma has NTRAC fusion, which I actually currently have some patients on, um, uh, so now let's go back to the Mark's case. Um, so Mark, uh, NGS reviewed the NTRAC gene fusion at the baseline. So what are the options? So now I'm going to review the data. So for those, um, uh, so for the, here currently there are two FDA approved track inhibitors, lyrotrictinib uh, and entrectinib. And there are two next generation uh, track inhibitors are being evaluated. And so now let's talk about uh, the first two. So um, this is a, a study, you can see uh, trick, inf uh, trick fusion is not very prevalent. And the most common, the more uh, prevalent disease are soft tissue sarcoma and thyroid cancer, salivary gland, lung cancer. And uh, so cholangiocarcinoma, uh, it's um, being reported, but it's not very highly prevalent. But the data is amazing. So this is uh, data um, of a 244 patient cohort, and there's the response rate, overall response rate was 69%. And there was a, tw uh, there, there was, um, what well, was, um, 21% um, uh, response rate, uh, no, 21% 20, of complete response rate, which is a very amazing results. I think this is truly a target therapy. And now um, the response does translate into survival benefit. So the, you can see the duration of response is very, is 32 months. And the PFS was 29 months. The over survival was, um, was not even reached was very um, effective treatment for those specific kind of patients with those mutations. So if you look at the safety, so I want you to focus on um, the bars uh, right to the middle line. And the darker bars are grade one, two AEs, and the, the, the green is grade three, and the burgundy color is grade four. So you can see most of the treatment-related AEs are grade one, two, mild, at mild level, and grade three and four AEs, you can see there was some change in transaminase and increase in weight um, and uh, neutropenia. So those are the, uh, but re not very common. And so here are some real-world data on lerotrictinib that have shown uh, a 78% uh, lower risk of death uh, with le le lerotrictinib compared to uh, stand of care. So um, this is truly a very effective treatment. And so now let's talk about uh, entrectinib. So this, so you can see there's a chemical structure and crystal uh, on the left and crystal structure in the middle and the signaling transduction pathway and of the trick and trick fusion. And so this 
This is a compound that's a pentric ROS1 alk inhibitor. So in the lower panel, you can see that's IC50 on how well this drug can inhibit those kinases. So here are the updated efficacy data. So you can see there's 150 patients with 17 different kind of fusion, NTRAC fusion positive tumor type and um, are enrolled in the study and with a medium uh, survival follow-up of 30 months, quite a good survival follow-up. If you look at the overall response rate, it's over 60%. And um, the, the median over survival was as good as 37 months. And so then on the middle column shows patients with CNS metastatic disease. Even in those patients, there was amazing overall uh, median over uh, median OS of 20 months. In patients without the CNS meds, the, the median over survival was, was 40 months. So this is a quite uh, uh, active uh, drug. So safety uh, overview, and it's very similar and across the, the, the class. I think most of the AEs are grade one, two AEs. And if uh, the grade three or uh, grade three AEs are the, or in the single digit percentage. And so if you look at the patient's needs dose reduction, about 27%, dose interruption 25%, discontinuation of the therapy from the treatment because of AE is quite low, 3.9%. So it is a quite well tolerated treatment. So now let's talk about the next generation trick inhibitor. Like, like all um, small molecule inhibitors, kinase inhibitors, patients do develop um, on-target uh, mutations that uh, result in resistance to, for the for first generation of NTRAC inhibitors. So, um, so there are three uh, tr trick genes, and you can see the, the red, green, and ye uh, yellow uh, spots are those are common sites for mutations that develop in patients who receive the first generation of uh, trick inhibitors. So um, the first drug I want to tell you about is uh, reportrictinib. And so this binds to the ATP binding domain with a very high affinity, can inhibit both wild type and mutant in uh, the trick kinase. And uh, the other one is uh, um, is uh, sertriptinib, and which is also a very uh, strong um, uh, it, it, uh, inhibitor to the kinase domain. So now I want to show you some some uh, data on sertriptinib, and so uh, you can see uh, so there's cases here uh, patients who develop. Um, trick uh, mutations at the kinase domain, and those are patients with uh, colorectal cancer, lung small cell ca uh, cancer, sarcoma, and cholangiocarcinoma. And so patients then get enrolled on the study, receiving this next generation uh, trick inhibitor, and the first two patients treated, you can see the cross image um, on the right pan on the right side showed very good response. So um, this is a recommendation, and so this is agnostic uh, approval. So patient with very uh, with a drug that very effective, and but patient can develop resistance over time. So it's recommended that when we put patients on this treatment, when you see those good response, then you would consider excision, ablation, radiation, try to really get rid of the tumor, and if you cannot, when patient develop. Uh, progression on the first generation of trick inhib uh, inhibitors, then patients should have a, a tissue uh, biopsy, liquid biopsy, tissue biopsy, try to identify to see if patient has developed on target mutations that uh, are the a candidate for the next generation of treatment, um, of uh, trick inhibitor treatment. So conclusion. So uh, immunotherapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors continue to be a very hot area for cholangiocarcinoma. Topaz-1, a randomized phase three study, met its primary endpoint uh, at the pre-specified interim analysis and demonstrate prolonged survival benefit compared to placebo plus gemsys. The value map did not add additional toxicities to that was observed uh, with gemsys and no new safe, safety signal was identified. Uh, bilirubin tract cancer 
as um, uh, as Reshna has uh, talked about earlier, is really truly genetically heterogeneous, um, with many potential targetable genetic alterations. So it is very important to uh, enroll patients on clinic trial if there's a clinic trial available. Always um, ke um, keep a look at new um, agnostic approval or specific approval for patients um, uh, that target therapy uh, for patients with certain uh, driving mutations. I think I'm going to hand over to Ashna and Dr. Aaron. Scott first. Uh. Okay, so moving on to next steps for next gen treatment. Um, so I would say the last five, six years and BTC management has just been so amazing. Uh, so much ground has been made up with all the different treatment options that we have now for targets. Um, it's truly impressive, and, and I, I think all of the other GI uh, subgroups are somewhat envious of uh, the BTC uh, cohorts. So uh, before I get into the presentation about uh, FGFR uh, aberrancy, I'm going to put the panel, our expert panel, in the hot seat here with a case and a couple questions. Uh, so we have a patient, a 60-year-old woman, who comes in with abdominal pain, fatigue, and unintentional weight loss, uh, some mild LFT abnormalities, and imaging that confirms a bilobar hepatic disease and pulmonary metastases with a biopsy of one of these liver lesions showing intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. The patient has an ECOG performance status of 1, and she was treated with upfront gemcitabine plus cisplatin and unfortunately progressed after four months. So the question for our panel here is, would she be a candidate for other therapy, in particular chemo? What targets would you consider, and how would you evaluate the targets to consider? I'm happy to start. Um, you know, I think as long as her performance status remains reasonable and, you know, mild elevations in a it, with bilirubin really don't scare us. I don't know what it is after Gemsys. Uh, hopefully it's not worse. It does sound like she would be a candidate for subsequent lines of therapy. Um, I think as Ruth kind of elegantly explained, the, the level one evidence is, is full fox. Uh, but, uh, you know, the data in ABC06 is relatively underwhelming. So, and, and then there's kind of the jury's out, I think, on Neliri and 5-FU. But there are 5-FU-based regimens that are an option. Um, but, you know, to what I think we've been belaboring, my hope would be that we have a clinical trial available for her and that we could consider her for that. Um, and, you know, in terms of considering targeted agents, we know that the earlier introduction of targeted therapy results in better efficacy, so absolutely we would want to consider it. And hopefully, as she got started on GEMSYS, she had comprehensive biomarker testing done um, to really evaluate the, the known markers and to see what we could potentially go after. I don't know if this point needs to be made more clear, but at what point in time do you do your profiling for your patients? You want to take that, Ruth? Um, I think right now um, we, uh, so uh, the current tissue profiling still takes weeks of time. And usually, I think currently we do, we have trials that testing target therapy in the frontline setting, but we currently don't have any um, approval. We, uh, but I think patients, we will for sure do like M um, MSI status and, and looking for her too. I think we do some in-house uh, testing, but for the tissue analysis is when patients start frontline therapy, I think at, at, at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would want to get a profile um, during the first line treatment to prepare a patient for second line treatment. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I basically, the second I meet the patient, if they haven't already had it ordered, I get it ordered. Got it. Okay, so moving on to, so let's say we got the testing, we found that the patient has an FGFR aberrancy. Um, there's about, uh, well, the literature uh, speaks to about 10 to 15 percent of patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma will have an FGFR um, aberrancy, and, and most of those, overwhelmingly the majority of those, will be FGFR2 fusions. Uh, so that while there's a variety of different oncogenic pathways in which FGFR signaling might be abnormal, 
for cholangiocarcinoma, and in particular, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, we are looking at FGFR gene rearrangements or fusions, FGFR2 in particular. Um, other tumor types will have a variety of different, uh, more common FGFR signaling aberrancies, but for intrahepatic cholangio, it's FGFR2. Um, interestingly, all the other different types of FGFR aberrancies are not well appreciated in ICC, nor um, is FGFR uh, aberrancy seen in extrahepatic or gallbladder uh, very often. So really, we're talking about ICC uh, subtypes. So there's a variety of different ways to test for FGFR. Uh, really, there's pros and cons for all four of these listed methods, IHC, FISH, PCR, and NGS. And as uh, I feel like the theme of this year is, uh, and for previous years as well, NGS is kind of the, the uh, gold standard at this point. Most uh, of our profiling is done through third-party companies, and you're really looking for companies or platforms that do whole transcriptome sequencing. Right, because you want to make sure you're trying to capture as much of the not only uh, genomic but transcriptomic information as possible with these fusions. Liquid biopsy is definitely something that we've been talking about. Um, there's a, a, a couple different uh, uh, posters, uh, abstracts that are presented at this GIASCO this year that have some really intriguing data for other GI subtypes, uh, disease groups. Uh, as of now, um, uh, ctDNA testing for BTCs is not as favorable. Uh, you know, I think the technology has some room to grow to improve the sensitivity and specificity for, for fusions. However, uh, that, that uh, technology is developing. So we'll see how the, what the future holds there. So back to our case. So we have a patient, 60-year-old woman, uh, ICC metastatic that's progressed on a gemcitabine-based regimen and was noted to have an FGFR2 BICC1 fusion uh, captured by NGS testing, what treatment options would you consider next? And what if the alteration had been captured earlier? Um, so, you know, in a patient with an FGFR2 fusion that we we're able to identify, I would absolutely offer this patient an FGFR inhibitor. Uh, we have three, possibly soon to be two, or soon to be two, FDA approved uh, drugs that are available on the market. Um, and I think, you know, there, there is absolutely no reason to not offer one of them to the patient. Um, the pemigatinib option and the futabatinib option are both, I think, great options for the patients, and I know you're going to go through the data, uh, but I would probably consider one of them first. That being said, there are a lot of next generation, second generation FGFR inhibitors with trials that are out there as well that we really need to be able to understand what this, this kind of next gen can do. So I think if we had a trial open, I would offer that patient one of the uh, FGFR inhibitor trials that we have. I agree. Yeah. I mean, sorry, going back to the question of what if the alteration had been captured earlier, I mean, if, to, to Ruth's point, unfortunately we're not as nimble with next generation sequencing and being able to get it in the real time that our patients really need it. Uh, I think we're getting better and better, but you know, these cholangiocarcinoma patients oftentimes uh, cannot wait to start uh, their frontline therapy. And so uh, it's a little bit tricky, but if by some sort of, you know, maybe they had had surgery and then they had their profiling done and then they recurred and we knew that they had an FGFR2 fusion there are frontline confirmatory studies that are ongoing um, for both futabatinib and pemigatinib. So if we had one of those trials, I would absolutely offer them one of those trials because the question of GEMSYS versus FGFR inhibitor is, is an important question. Again, I think Dervalimab kind of changes that and we don't really know what FGFR inhibitor patients are doing, how they're doing yet on GEMSYS Dorva. We have some kind of early work that AstraZeneca has been looking at to really better understand all of that. But, you know, it's a little bit of a murky space now with the fact that we have a new st standard of care in the frontline setting. So maybe profiling at the first diagnosis for metastatic disease and or unresectability. Yes, absolutely. As we mentioned, uh, multiple approvals over the past several years, a very exciting time for BTC um, uh, providers and patients alike. Uh, started with the MSI High data in 2017 with pembrolizumab approval. Um, as uh, Ruth had mentioned uh, and got into the data based on the intract fusion uh, tumors, 
Um, and then we will get into the infogratinib, pimigatinib, and fudibatinib approvals for FGFR aberrant uh, BTCs. Uh, in addition, we have IDH1 and HER2 amplified um, cholangiocarcinomas that uh, Dr. Schroff will go into uh, later tonight. And then just uh, a bit about the emerging targets. So there's a variety of other uh, targets out there that uh, I, I believe Dr. Schroff will get into as well. But uh, a very exciting time for BTC management. So first, um, FGFR-targeted uh, therapy that was approved was pimigatinib. Uh, this was in April of 2020. Uh, it was based on a relatively small phase two trial, had three cohorts. Cohort A um, enrolled adults with locally advanced or metastatic cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, FGFR2 uh, 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 re gene rearrangement or fusion and progression on a gemcitabine-based regimen. Um, cohort B and C, similar, um, uh, cohort B had a similar patient population. Cohort uh, B, C had a um, no gene rearrangement um, inclusion exclusion. So cohort A uh, was the, um, co the, the cohort that did really well. Uh, the overall response rate at 37%. Cohort B and C did not uh, see any uh, response rates, uh, as well as uh, really just stable disease of their best response. However, in cohort A, we can see that there were three complete responders and a partial response uh, with 34 uh, patients, so a very impressive um, uh, and compared to historic control, uh, clearly um, a winner here with pimigatinib. Um, the survival data also looked very impressive with the uh, cohort A patients. So in that cohort, 108 patients, we saw that the uh, median PFS was seven months and the median OS was 17.5 months, whereas uh, the, the uh, survival data for PFS and OS really uh, did not do uh, better than historic control with the cohort B and C uh, subgroups. And the waterfall plot and duration of response data also looked very impressive. Um, as uh, we discussed, uh, the, the complete responders, the PR patients were um, uh, very impressive with this uh, drug and the duration of response was 9.1 months. So uh, for second line or greater cholangiocarcinoma patients, this truly was an astounding uh, achievement um, and uh, led to its approval, pimigatinib's approval in 2020. Uh, infogratinib was uh, the next comer on the block for approval. Uh, patients were similar um, um, in terms of their characteristics. They had to have had cholangiocarcinoma, FGFR2 uh, aberration, and progressed on a gym side bean based regimen. Um, the primary endpoint for this trial was also response rate, and the overall response rate here was 23.1%. Um, the um, duration of response was also uh, similar to what we saw in pimigatinib, as well as the survival curves of the median PFS of 7.3 months and a median OS of 12.2 months. Uh, the um, other thing I wanted to mention about uh, the infogratinib trial is uh, while the overall response rate was uh, slightly lower than that compared to pimigatinib. And of course, we all learn early on in our training, don't do cross-trial comparisons, but it's just important to note the number of patients, I think, that, that were treated uh, third line or greater on infogratinib was a larger uh, cohort than the pimigatinib study. And then the third agent to receive FDA approval for FGFR2 operations was fudibatinib. And fudibatinib also enrolled a similar patient cohort. So we're kind of getting into a crowded space here, right? We have now three drugs, three small uh, molecule TKIs that are approved for FGFR aberrations. Um, fudibatinib had a very impressive objective response rate as well, 41.7%. Uh, with one person having a, a complete response and 42 patients having uh, partial responses. So when you look across the, the, um, the data for the endpoints for infogratinib, pimigatinib, fudibatinib, arguably somewhat similar, uh, 
Um, of course, the breakdown between uh, the previous lines of therapy that, that uh, patients received on each of these trials somewhat varies. The infogratinib having a, a slightly higher amount of patients that had a later lines treatment. But the survival data looks pretty similar across the board. And we have a, a couple uh, newcomers on the block, so to speak, uh, that are working, drugs that are working their way through the pipeline. Uh, Ertafitinib, which is um, currently uh, an open um, uh, basket study with an expansion cohort in clangiocarcinoma, uh, the Ragnar trial, that uh, recently reported an overall response rate of 60%. Um, and then the darzantinib um, also having a response rate uh, in the 20% range. So uh, very interesting and uh, um, um, kind of a crowded space. It's becoming more crowded here with the FGFR2 uh, targets. As a class, we know that there are certain side effects to watch out for. So the AAE-specific um, FGFR signaling pathway inhibitions are hyperphosphatemia is number one. 60, 70 percent of patients are going to have hyperphosphatemia, and we'll go through kind of the, the approach for that. In addition, we see a lot of nail uh, bed changes and uh, hair modification, alopecia, uh, dry skin, dry eye. Uh, rarely we get into the more of the uh, uh, retinal detachment, retinal um, pigmentation issues, uh, as well as um, joints and, and muscle aches. Um, most, uh, all of these uh, small molecule TKIs have some um, off-target effects as well, right? They, they inhibit uh, VEGF uh, our receptor family in addition to the FGFR. And that will lead to hypertension, proteinuria, et cetera, that we see with our FGFR, or VEGF targets. So how do we treat FGFR inhibitor-associated hyperphosphatemia? Well, first and foremost, prevention is key. Right, so like everyone who goes on to, to uh, or is going to go on to receive an FGFR inhibitor should be counseled on, on how to make dietary modifications. I know at our center we have a, a dietitian that we work closely with, a pamphlet, a handbook. I know that the, the foundation has a lot of resources for patients as well. So really getting a nutritionist involved early to help reduce the amount of um, 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 phosphate in a diet, really it's avoiding junk food, I mean soda, Etc. cetera, uh, fairly straightforward. If you start seeing a rise in the phosphate level, that's when you start to think about introducing a phosphate binder. Um, usually the paradigm that, that we follow is very similar to what you see on the screen here. Um, if it's a, a, a subclinical, and usually it will be, you start a phosphate binder at the lowest possible dose and you recheck phosphate levels after a week. If the phosphate levels are higher uh, in the seven to nine to, to almost 10 range, then you would use a higher dose and potentially think about using acetazolamide and you recheck the phosphate levels at a uh, more, more closely um, in time interval. And then if it's above 10, generally speaking, we're stopping the treatment, right? We're, we are adding all of those agents to, to support the medications to bring down the phosphate in addition to holding the FGFR inhibitor. And if it can't go lower by after restarting and restarting at a, maybe a lower dose level, then you have to consider permanently discontinuing the, um, the inhibitor. The FGFR inhibitor associated ocular toxicities, generally speaking, you know, all patients that go on these drugs, generally speaking, we're going to have dry eye, dry skin, that sort of thing. And so, again, early prevention is at key. Uh, saline drops uh, really go a long way for a lot of our patients. That's really helps their symptoms. In, um, in general, we're having patients see the ophthalmology immediately, you know, as baseline and then throughout the course of their care. And as I mentioned, um, the serious eye conditions, retinal detachment, that sort of thing are relatively uncommon. Uh, but you need to work closely with your, your multi-D and, and specialists to make sure that uh, that's being monitored. And in terms of uh, other multi-D subspecialists that you might want to consider looping in would be your dermatologists. Um, as I mentioned, dry skin, rash, and nail bed changes are also a pretty common um, uh, issue for these patients on uh, these therapies. And very rarely, although it's been seen uh, in our center, uh, cal calciphylaxis can occur. So all of these types of um, issues that you want to be thinking about as soon as you consider having a patient go on an FGFR inhibitor. 
And then I'm gonna end on the FGFR mutation data. So while the FGFR2 uh, uh, rearrangement fusion data looks very, very promising, mutations um, have not been as, um, as, as promising. Um, this trial with infogratinib showed that of five patients that had a mutation, best response was stable disease. Similar to um, infogratinib is the pimigatinib data, where we see in the uh, additional cohorts with um, FGFR genetic alterations, including mutations, there were zero responses, right? So the trend for uh, uh, responses and, and benefit outside of the, the fusion uh, subgroup is unfortunately um, uh, low. Uh, the provocative thing about Derizantinib, which is a drug that we haven't spent too much time talking about and mentioned in the table, is that it did show a median PFS for patients with FGFR mutations similar to that that we would see for fusion um, patients. And then I'll end on uh, this uh, uh, slide discussing the uh, Relay 4008 uh, molecule, which is a, a very interesting drug in that uh, also a small molecule inhibitor, but it specifically targets uh, with high selectivity and irreversibly uh, FGFR2. So there's two reasons that's important. One is the data uh, shows that for both FGFR naive and treated patients, there are responses, right? So just to say that again, uh, patients that have progressed based on on-target mutations on another FGFR inhibitor, we, this, the data shows that the patients may have a, a, a response with uh, this drug. Second is that the side effect profile changes, right? So without the FGFR1 inhibition, you don't have the phosphate issue. The, the hyperphosphatine be, becomes less um, of a, a problem. And the, the, the FGFR4 uh, um, um, also becomes less of a problem with the skin and uh, hair toxicity. Uh, issue. So toxicity profile may be uh, somewhat improved. We'll have to see what the uh, later, uh, larger trials show. Uh, but this data certainly is very intriguing, especially in patients who have received or progressed on um, FGFR um, treatment in the, uh, in the past. And then there's a couple other uh, drugs that are in the pipeline. One, uh, TT00420, uh, which had a small group, five, five patients total, I believe, in, in the phase one trial. Also a small mo molecule in inhibitor, uh, TKI for FGFR. Um, and this is also in fast track designation for patients with uh, CCA based on two patients um, with a partial response. And that's it. All right, let's just take this moment, oh, okay, to answer the questions that came up on your iPad. Uh, if you could please take a, a minute to answer those polling questions. So I'm gonna take on the rest of the other targets, or at least some of the, the hot tar targets that we all talk about. Um, you know, FGFR has a lot of attention because we have a lot of drugs uh, available to us, which is a wonderful, uh, wonderful problem to have. Uh, there are other targets, however, that are very relevant and need to be identified in our patients with biliary tract cancers. And uh, that includes IDH1, uh, much more common than IDH2, but basically the IDH mutations. Uh, you can see them kind of right down here, here. This is part of a, they're kind of a metabolic pathway uh, related to uh, alpha ketoglutarate. Uh, other relevant targets include HER2, BRAF, and then actually kind of a, a smattering of a number of other targets that are starting to become targetable in a really exciting way, including KRAS. So I'll start with IDH. This was the pivotal phase three clarity trial. This was a study that looked at the oral IDH1 inhibitor, ivacitinib, and it was in patients in the second and or third line setting. So they had to have progressed on one to two prior therapies. Uh, at least one of them had to have gemcitabine or 5-FU. And they had to have an IDH1 mutation confirmed centrally. These patients were randomized in a two to one fashion. At this time, at the time that we designed Clarity, we did not have a standard of care. We did not have ABC06 data out. And so the study was designed to be oral ivacitinib daily continuous in a two-to-one fashion to a placebo. So this was a double-blinded placebo-controlled study. Uh, but you know, again, the power of 
patient involvement, advocacy, Carcinoma Foundation, and bringing investigators uh, like all of us to the table, the company very kindly allowed for crossover, recognizing that to offer a patient placebo was really not the right thing to do. So this study was designed with crossover uh, to ivacinib at the time of disease progression, assuming that, every, uh, that the patient maintained eligibility. Uh, and so you'll see that the, the data here, the median, uh, the primary endpoint was median progression-free survival. Because there was crossover allowed, median OS could not be the primary endpoint. So median PFS, blinded PFS, was the primary endpoint. And when you look at the numbers, it doesn't look very exciting. It's uh, improvement in median PFS from 1.4 to 2.7 months, months, but it was a very strongly significant hazard ratio of 0.37. Um, so there was a 73% reduction in the risk of, pro of progression. Uh, and again, when you kind of look at it graphically and see it play out, the six-month PFS rate and the 12-month PFS rate, you know, the patients, unfortunately, on the placebo arm quickly dropped off, and, and you know, there was a little bit of a tail when it came to the IVO arm. Uh, there was not many responses. This is not a, this is not a cytoreductive drug. It's primarily cytostatic. Uh, the overall response rate was 2%. But when you look at disease control and include stable disease, it went up to uh, 53% compared to 28% in the placebo arm. The median OS was numerically improved from 7.5 months to 10.3 months. But again, OS is, is the un understanding OS data and the setting of crossover is really kind of cloudy. So they had written into the protocol a pre-specified uh, analysis called the rank preserving structural failure time. And when you do that, you basically take out the noise that's associated with crossover. And that statistical modeling demonstrated that the uh, placebo arm, uh, that, that the improvement in median OS was almost double. Again, not the primary endpoint, not the intention to treat analysis, but I just want to put that in the context because it's really important. So based on that data, this led to the FDA approval uh, for uh, IDH1 mutated uh, advanced cholangiocarcinoma patients in August of 2021. Um, here, you can, again, you can kind of see that data head to head. I just want to primarily point out that, again, when you look at the six-month and the 12-month rates, that's really where I think you kind of start to see whether or not these drugs are providing actual benefit to our patients. Uh, cholangiocarcinoma patients, unfortunately, when you look at Kaplan-Meier curves, oftentimes you see this really steep drop-off drop off at the beginning. And, and so the fact that this drug had a, a you know, somewhat reasonable uh, six-month PFS, 12-month PFS, and six-month OS and 12-month OS. I think is really important. And again, this here it kind of shows you exactly what I was talking about with the rank preserving structural failure time. So you see that uh, the, the curves kind of separate a little bit more strongly. That's the green line is the um, rank preserving structural failure time adjusted median OS. And that's where you see that hazard ratio of 0 0.49. Um, and, you know, that kind of effect of the placebo going down to 5.1 months versus 10.3. When we talk about ivacinidib, ivacinidib is overall relatively well tolerated. When you look at the treatment emergent adverse events, uh, less than half of the patients experienced a grade three or greater TEAE um, in either arm. Uh, and the uh, most common ones were actually somewhat kind of disease related oftentimes, like fatigue and ascites and things like that. Uh, treatment discontinuation was actually more common with the placebo arm than with, the t with ivacitinib. And dose reductions, interruptions, et cetera, uh, were, were, not, were, were relatively negligible, not, not strikingly concerning in terms of tolerance. Uh, this is really, you know, I, I've given this drug a lot. This is a relatively well-tolerated drug. So, you know, IDH is an important uh, target. We see it in about 20% of patients, uh, or so the initial data suggests. Um, and we have ivacinidib. But again, admittedly, those numbers are they're statistically significant, but how much of a clinically meaningful, be meaningful benefit are we getting? So, of course, we're looking to kind of the next frontier in terms of IDH targeting. There's a lot of really interesting data that looks at the way in which uh, IDH inhibition uh, can kind of modulate the immune microenvironment. There's some really fantastic work out of Nabil Bardisi's lab at MGH and a lot of other um, colleagues who are looking at this. And so there's a lot of interest in combining uh, IDH and um, IDH mutated patients and giving them immunotherapy based approaches. So there, these are just some ongoing studies, uh, including Olaparib with Dervalimabs or Olaparib being an oral PARP inhibitor. 
Um, there's also the kind of second generation ideation inhibitor, that's the LY3410738 compound. Uh, again, in kind of preclinical models and in vitro and in vivo models, there seems to be, uh, it seems to be a, a potent IDH inhibitor, and it also demonstrates what potentially could be overcoming some of the known IDH uh, ivacitinib related resistance mutations. So a lot of us have this, stu this study open in our centers, and there's an biliary expansion cohort, so it'll be interesting to kind of see where that falls out. So moving on to the uh, HER2 uh, space, you know, there, there's always been a lot of interest in targeting this pathway. Uh, and the obvious starting point was starting with EGFR targeting in, in inhibitors. And there's been a lot of studies that have looked at this. Uh, the BINGO trial was probably one of the largest trials. This looked at cetuximab in combinations um, with chemotherapy-based uh, compounds. And uh, that trial was negative. There was a panitumumab study, and there was an erlotinib study. Uh, and again, not really anything particularly exciting using these kind of either uh, monoclonal antibodies or TKIs in the EGFR space. Uh, but the HER2 targeting agents is really kind of where there's a lot of buzz and a lot of excitement. And, you know, it started with trastuzumab because that seemed like the obvious place to start. But now there have been a number of drugs that have been developed in this space. Uh, Verlitinib is one of the earlier ones. This is an oral uh, multi-targeting kind of HER2, HER4, EGFR, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And the TREETOP trial was conducted here that looked at second-line patients and, and um, gave them or Verlitinib with... Uh, Cape cytobine uh, with or without verlitinib, and uh, this was a negative trial. Uh, but we have trastuzumab deruxtecan, which uh, is kind of an ongoing and a really exciting drug and involving in the, in the cholangiocarcinoma space. There's uh, a panher irreversible TKI nar neratinib that has some interesting data out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, xanadatumab, which is a bispecific antibody, and then the tucatinib and trastuzumab uh, combination in, in a number of HER2 altered uh, uh, solid tumors. So let's just quickly talk about trastuzumab deruxtecan. Everybody loves this drug. Everybody's really excited about this drug. Um, it has a, there's, there, there was the HERB trial that was presented at ASCO this year, which was done completely in Asia, but there's also a basket trial that includes a couple biliary patients. There's a, gall, there's a gallbladder cancer group, and then there's the um, cholangial carcinoma group, and you can see the gallbladder is the, is the green and uh, the kind of, yeah, dark green, and then the cholangial carcinoma is the orange. And so, you know, this, everyone has their eyes on this drug. We're in the number of patients being enrolled into the kind of biliary expansion is, is ongoing. And so I think we need to really understand this drug. You know, when the HERB trial was presented earlier this year, there was some concern potentially about pneumonitis and you know, we know that trastuzumab deruxtecan can absolutely cause pneumonitis, and we all of our patients get gemcitabine up front, which has a pneumonitis potential. So it's it's hard to know exactly um, what that looks like in our patients until we really expand the population. The My Pathway study is kind of one of the first real uh, publications that came out in terms of HER2 targeting in metastatic biliary cancers. This was pertuzumab plus trastuzumab, and there was a specific biliary tract cancer cohort within this basket study. Patients had to have HER2 amplification, HER2 overexpression, or both, and they had to have been previously treated. And there was 39 patients that were planned to be enrolled on the pertuz pertuzumab and trastuzumab with a primary endpoint of investigator-assessed overall response rate. Uh, and basically what was seen with a median follow-up of 8.1 months is that the overall response rate was 23%. Uh, Treatment-related grade 3 AEs were kind of nothing surprising or anything that we don't usually see in cholangiocarcinomas and biliary cancers, like elevations of LFTs and things like that. Uh, but there were no treatment-related serious AEs and no treatment-related grade 4 events. And so in general, it's really felt that pertuzumab and trastuzumab is an option for patients with previously treated HER2-positive metastatic biliary tract cancers. Here you can see the breakdown. This was biliary tract cancer, so it included all. It included enterohepatic, extrahepatic, gallbladder, ampullary. Um, I will say that HER2 amplifications are most commonly seen in gallbladder cancer. We see them in about 10 to 15%, upwards sometimes of 20, depending on which, which study we look at, and extrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, where we see them in about 10%. So it's really those kind of areas of, in terms of of patients that we really start to think about her to looking for her to amplifications. But you can see that, for instance, small numbers, 16 patients in the gallbladder cohort, but the overall response rate in a very refractory patient population was 31% with uh, a duration of response of seven months and, an, and a median OS of 14.2 months. So definitely provocative and intriguing.
Moving on to Xanadatamab. Xanadatamab is a uh, bispecific HER2 targeted antibody. So this is uh, a monoclonal uh, antibody that um, can, that, <laughs> that, uh, sorry. Xanadatamab is uh, a HER2, is a receptor, promotes receptor clustering, and basically HER2 can be targeted by the two different Xanadatamab uh, antibodies. It binds to HER2 along a variety of expression levels and basically leads to clustering, internalization, and then subsequent downregulation. Um, so it's a really interesting drug because it's got the trastuzumab and pertuzumab binding domain. And so a lot of us were really excited about this when Dr. Merrick Bernstein presented the initial data, which was in a very small cohort of patients. Uh, this was uh, pu published, or uh, I believe, in 2021, and this was the phase one study that basically led to the to the development of the pivotal trial. Here, this was 20 patients. Again, this was a very uh, refractory patient population. I think the median number, median lines of prior therapies, was around three. And you can see that the overall response rate was 40% with a disease control rate of 65% and a duration of response of about 7.4 months. So we're starting to see themes, right? We're starting to see targets that have overall responses in the anywhere from 25 to 40% in duration of responses that are on the order, that are definitely on, on the longer side of the PFSs that we're used to seeing in you know, chemotherapy-based second line and beyond settings. So based on this initial data with ZW25, as it was known at that time, the Horizon BTC study was uh, developed. This was in patients with, again, locally advanced or metastatic biliary tract cancers who had centrally confirmed HER2 amplification and had at least one prior line of therapy that involved gemcitabine. So there's 100, 100 patients planned to receive single agent xanadatumab with a primary endpoint of overall response rate. Uh, we have not seen the data yet, but we have seen the press release. And so this apparently uh, is really exciting and I believe hopefully will be an option for our patients in an accelerated approval pathway potentially, if not full approval soon. So those are kind of the more quote unquote common IDH and HER2, but there are absolutely groups of, of patients that we need to identify and we need to look for, and that's really why comprehensive next generation sequencing and profiling is really imperative in these patients because while they may not have an IDH mutation or an FGFR2 fusion, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they don't have a targetable alteration. Uh, and the perfect example of that is, the, is, is our patients with BRAF V600E mutated biliary tract cancer. Uh, this is seen in about 3 to 5%, primarily intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. You can occasionally see them in extrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. Uh, and this was the BASKET trial, the phase 2 ROAR trial that looked at dual inhibition with BRAF and MEK inhibitors, dibrafenib and trametinib. And this was the biliary cancer cohort. Uh, I can tell you I put patients on this trial, and it was really impressive the way that they would respond with a durable response. Uh, but this is the waterfall plot from that, from that cohort, and the overall response rate was 51% uh, by investigator assessment and 47% by independent review. And again, really refractory patients. These were not necessarily just second-line patients. The median PFS was nine months by investigator assessment and the median OS of 14 months. Uh, this is a really important but rare alteration to identify because we have a tumor agnostic approval for BRAF B600E mutated cancers to involve dibrafenib and trametinib. So just very quickly talking about other targets, we always think about DNA repair and the potential of PARP inhibition. Uh, we know just by looking at a lot of profiling and, and frankly even the ABC, ABC group has published on the collection of ABC data, the DNA repair and HRD is seen in about a quarter, 20 to 25% of patients with biliary tract cancers. Uh, and so, you know, obvious questions were, you know, does the addition of cisplatin, is that why? Is that why the ABCO2 study was positive? It's hard to know. But we also know that there are other mechanisms beyond platinum for targeting these patients, and PARP inhibitors are obviously one of those. Um, there is a study that is being looked at, at led by Dan Ahn, and it's, I believe it's through the accru, the accru mechanism, that is a phase two study of elaparib in patients with advanced biliary tract cancer that have aberrant DNA repair. They're just on single agent elaparib, and it's a Simon two stage, so they're looking for eight, 18 patients first, and then a potential additional 14 patients. Uh, there's also kind of an interesting trial looking at niraparib in BAP1 and other DDR-deficient neoplasms, which obviously BAP1 is a known alteration in the biliary tract cancer space, so we're kind of interested in that trial just to look at our potential biliary cancer patients that would go on it. 
And then, of course, there's a lot of other targets in trial. Um, and this does not even a comprehensive list. There's, um, <laughs> I gave a talk at the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation last year, I think, uh, where we talked about hot new targets in cholangiocarcinoma, and they tried to make me do it in like 20 minutes, and I think I totally went over time because there was so many things to talk about in this space. Um, Obvious ones include things like KRAS, of course. Um, it is a primarily G12D mutation that we see primarily in extrahepatic and, and gallbladder cancer patients. But there's a lot of interest, obviously, in that space. Uh, but there's a lot of kind of a smattering of other things that we're looking at. And like I said, this is by no means comprehensive. There's a number of ongoing trials looking at these inhibitors that are listed there. Uh, we're also really keeping our eye on things like MDM2 amplifications and, uh, you know, of course, the second generation of a lot of these uh, known, alt known uh, targets that we need to think through as we start to think through resistance. So I'm gonna ask you to answer the questions that come up on your iPad again. Uh, and so take a moment to answer the follow-up poll on targeted therapy options. And then we will move to the case. So let's go back to Charlotte. So remember, she was the one that had hepatic disease, pulmonary mets, treated with gemcyst, progressed after four months. So I'm gonna ask my panelists here, what if the patient presented, uh, but this time you had an IDH1 mutation that was found? Thoughts, what would you do? <laughs> I think that's, we have an indication. And well, so patients with IDH1 mutation, those tumor are usually quite aggressive and the, out, the prognosis is poor. I, I think um, I would uh, try to take advantage of the IDH1 inhibitor in this case. Okay, how about Aaron? Let's move to the next part of that question. What if additional testing confirmed her two positive disease? What would you do there? Yeah, in that case, if you have concurrent uh, HER2 positive disease, amplified disease, and an IDH1 mutation, I would probably focus on the HER2 targeting first. Um, the data is just, to me, a little more compelling for achieving response and, and survival benefit. Um, to the point that was just made, you know, IDH1 mutants generally have a a more aggressive uh, subtype. So uh, anything to help bolster response in this, in this scenario, I probably would choose. Okay. All right, so that's the end of the formal presentations. We have a lot of questions that have already come through on the iPad, but please feel free to keep putting in more so that we can be sure to answer all of your questions. We have, you know, a little bit of time to make sure we touch on everybody's. Uh, it, please don't necessarily just raise your hand because we want to make sure that everybody, both online as well as live, can hear your questions. So please use the iPad mechanism for your questions. But I will start. There's a lot in here. <laughs> um, so I'll start. There's a, a good number of questions here related to immunotherapy, Ruth. So I'll start with you. Um, so for the topaz regimen, you know, what is, in clinical practice, what are you currently doing? So to your point about gemcis, six months, myelosuppression, uh, do you just fully stop the chemotherapy and just continue Dorva as a maintenance as was designed in topaz? Do you keep the gemcitabine? Because, you know, Keynote 966 is designed a little bit differently, and I think that's why a lot of us are very interested in seeing that data. But yeah. what, are, what are you doing in practice? Um, so... Uh, um, so for the Topaz-1 study, the chemo stopped at the six months. So there's a, um, uh, a study, another study that's ongoing, and well, that will soon um, uh, open for enrollment, is um, to test other chemo, um, cis uh, or gem-based chemo regimen in combination with, um, with the Viumab. And that's a trial. And uh, also to look at uh, patients with um, uh, poor performance status, and then you get, just get the gemcitabine, to really try to collect safety data. Um, so I, I think um, if patient is able to tolerate without any myelosuppression, I think um, in, in practice before Topaz-1, their physicians will just stop at six months because of difficulty and of toxicities, other people will continue gemcitabine-based regimen. I think it's reasonable to continue, um, but the trial, it's, um, I think uh, it will be an international trial, and it's just mainly to collect data 
And so I think hopefully with that, those the data from that trial, we get additional information. Okay. Yeah, and then just to clarify, the Keynote 966, the, the small distinction between the two studies is that gemcitabine is continued. So the maintenance with pembrolizumab involves a chemotherapy still. So it will be gem plus pembro. So I think a lot of us are really interested to see what that looks like. Um, so there's another question in here. There's a lot of interest, I think, in how we in clinic manage elevated bilirubins. So um, what are the contraindications for, you, for use of our current therapies in terms of elevations in bilirubin? Um, and there's a specific question here about uh, ivocitinib. I mean, the, the, there's clear directions on ivocitinib in terms of my, uh, elevations in bilirubin, and there's a cutoff that's recommended in terms of uh, using ivo and or dose-reducing ivo. So, you know, I just tend to follow those, those guidelines when it comes to ivo. Um, I don't know about you guys, but with Gemsys, Durva, do you have specific hard and fast criteria? I know I make my pharmacists very nervous with the bilirubins I'm willing to tolerate. Yeah, so uh, usually I would uh, not, um, the, my, three is my cutoff. Um, oh, you're making me feel bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, um, I think because those patients, okay. So if I'm anxious to start patients and I do, I do five FU based regimen mm -hmm. until I can have the biliary obstruction resolved. Um, as part of stand of care. And um, I, 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 5-FU platinum combination does have good activity. Aaron, do you have any different thoughts y there? Yeah, I would, I would say um, I have a similar practice. Uh, three, and depending on the performance status of the patient and um, exactly where they are in their treatment, I might tolerate slightly higher levels. Um, but generally speaking, it's it's something of, of, of around three or less that I'd feel comfortable continuing that combination. And um, also doing lower GI, I do full FOX and KPOX quite often. And, and um, as uh, Ruth just mentioned, I think five of you based treatments are sometimes a good uh, workaround yeah. for that issue. All right, there's a question here about FGFR, and it says, would you consider adding an FGFR inhibitor to a chemo platform? So I guess chemo plus FGFR for patients uh, with uh, FGFR aberrant BTC with rapidly progressing disease. Aaron, any thoughts on that up front? I think it's always a, you know, an interesting question in how to elicit a higher response rate, especially if patients are symptomatic as, as these patients can be. Um, it can be uh, you know, an, an awful experience when patients have a, a rapidly progressing liver mets. Um, I would say, though, that you know the, the data for response rates pretty pretty striking, right? For the FGFR inhibitors, um, so you're kind of trying to do what's um, improve upon good. And I'm not so sure that the chemo, especially if you're talking second line or greater, right? The, the experience with chemo uh, in those patients that setting is, is is fairly low for response rates. So I'm I'm not so sure that you're going to really achieve. What you what you are looking for in that line, um, in that setting, but you know it's an uh, interesting question. I think one that that could be explored. Uh, to my knowledge, is not a clinical trial that it has. Yeah, it's uh, amazing that people with uh, FGFR fusion usually they have better prognosis, and the patients I've had later I found out after uh, they've done well for quite a while for with Gemsys. And then I found out they have the fusion, then I put them on the second line. So we actually don't really have data the FGF of, uh, inhibitor would um, improve the response rate, or will, um, do you have additive effect or synergistic effect? I think it, it's difficult to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, the, the theme of the oral abstract session today, right, was more is not always better. So, you know, I think there, and I think the other concern I have is, is the FGFR inhibitors are wonderful, but they do have their own, as Dr. Scott went through, they have their own set of toxicities. And I just think, you know, the ability to, to tolerate a, either Gemsys Plus or Full Fox Plus might be a, a, a little much in terms of patients and quality of life and things like that. Um, okay, there is a lot of interest in trying to understand candidate biomarkers for immunotherapy beyond PDL1 in biliary tract cancers. Any comments on that, Ruth? So um, I think um, the, uh, there's about 60% of the patients enrolled in the Topaz-1 study has tissue. Mm 
So there are a lot of sequencing analysis and I think based on the data I've seen so far, t today only the, a small portion of the data was presented, but there's a lot, a, a lot more data presented at ESMO Asia. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we truly have figured out uh, what would be a good immune biomarker. Um, I think the, uh, the, what I t t took ho uh, home from that uh, paper, um, that abstract presented at a ESMO Asia, is uh, really looks like patients with BRCA or HDR tend to do better. Um, I, I think the question is, is that the benefit, uh, I, part of that is benefit uh, of those patients from platinum drug, but uh, even the combination the, of uh, the, the Viumab plus GEMSYS, the response rate is even higher. So we actually quite, don't quite understand how, um, how, how this two um, uh, pull it, play together. But I, I think so far, all these immune biomarkers, I don't think we've found any, uh, we found any reliable ones. Yeah, I mean, I think their, their current deep dive into the biomarker analysis of Topaz is just ongoing, and yes. I think hopefully, you know, as more time goes by, we'll learn more and more. I mean, they're, uh, you know, as a testament to the Topaz investigators, they have openly said they are committed to releasing all of the data so that we can ensure that we really understand mm -hmm. uh, you know, if there are subsets of what those biomarkers are, et cetera. Um, so there's a question about sequencing of FDA approved and investigational FGFR2 inhibitors, uh, Dr. Scott. Um, so, you know, we have two on the market, we have a couple in trial. How do you, how do you approach it? Yeah, so choice of FGFR2 inhibitor? Is yes. that kind of the question? Sequencing and how you approach it. Yeah. Um, well, sequencing, that's an interesting like, question, right? Outside of the fact that you would, you know, use it for the indication that it's approved for, which is second line or greater, uh, FGFR2 aberration in ICC patients progressed on gym. Um, you, you know, I think it's dealer's choice for the agents that are approved. Uh, there really isn't a, a study that we can point to. There's no randomized trial, right? Um, so at this point, we're kind of comparing cross-trial, which is kind of a no-no. But in general, I would believe that the, the survival data is very similar. And as uh, Ruth mentioned, you know, usually these are fairly indolent, um, relatively speaking. So trying to, while the response rates are great, uh, I think the survival data trumps the response rates, right? And, and across the board, those, that, that looks pretty similar across all, all the agents. So long story short, I, I don't think there should be necessarily a preference to date. I do think that the next generation um, FGFR inhibitors, including the, the Relay 4008 data is very compelling uh, for patients that have received or, or uh, progressed, developed an, an on-target uh, mutation in FGFR, having response with that drug. Uh, makes it that, you know, we look forward to future agents. But right now, the FDA approvals being what they are, I, I don't necessarily have a, a winner, so to speak. Anything different that you would add, Ruth? No, I think they would yeah. answer. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, everyone knows the really elegant data out of MGH that, you know, Dr. Goyle led in terms of understanding because infogratinib was really the first trial that was opened and patients who were on infogratinib and following with CTDNA and understanding kind of the the polyclonal resistance that emerges with gatekeeper mutations and kind of closing off the ATB binding pocket and the potential utility of futabatinib in that space. Um, so all of us theoretically love it. I will tell you, I routinely call Lippy and I'm like, okay, this is what the CTDNA show, should I do this? I think all of us are kind of doing it, but the honest truth is if you want to be a purist, that there's really not clarity on how to potentially sequence these, these yet. But all of us who see these patients know that we want to be able to offer all of them to them in a sequential manner. Uh, and hopefully as we have these kind of next generation uh, drugs like Relay that had a cohort of, you know, pre-treated FGFR patients, that's closed. But, you know, hopefully we'll get better data and really start to understand what we can do to hopefully, in like, like they do in lung cancer, like how can we slowly but surely offer sequential lines of, of FGFR inhibition. Um, so there's a question here about using immunotherapy. Would you hesitate to use first-line Dorva plus Gemsys in a biliary tract cancer patient who is known to be positive for a biomarker that can be targeted? So, you know, I guess if by some miracle you have everything and you have a FGFR2 fusion and you have your Gemsys Dorva, that's an option. And, you know, what, what do you do in those spaces, Ruth? 
kind of like currently I, th I just really don't think we have data we don't we don't have any comparison data so uh, not all target therapy or this have the same efficacy data like if you have the FGFR uh, fusion and then those data are quite good and I, I think it, with very high response rate so I think we will I, I think that's why we have those trials in the frontline setting to really see. Um, but I think after that, maybe it's a, a little more clear. Of course, I cannot uh, imagine at this point that we, we would do comparison. I, I think also immunotherapy, this is just the first combination. I, mm -hmm. I do believe we're going to have more uh, different combinations um, that, uh, that come into the front line. All right, and with that, we are officially out of time. I apologize that we did not get to all of the questions, but you know, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to answer questions. Uh, and just a reminder to visit us at peerview.com slash biliary-sf23 to complete and submit your post-test and evaluation for credit. Please do feel free to download the slides and practice aids and watch the replay of this event in the next 24 hours and the online activity in the coming weeks. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. <laughs>